She's been present at the birth of all our children. She's been a goddess mama. Um, she's family. The one thing, she's taught me a lot of things over the year, but the one thing Heather Ash does really well is encourage people to say yes. Yes when you think you can do something. Yes when you're stuck. Yes when your beliefs about who you are are limiting yourself. And that's really what this book is about. And when she called me, we talk a lot from airports. I'm here in Davis. When she called me and said, this book, I want to get this book on the New York Times bestseller list. That is my dream. I said, great, let's do a book launch. And I talked to Heather. This Heather. <laughs> um, the last event we did here was with Amy Goodman. And so I think we have a track record of many really powerful, um, uplifting women with important things to say to Davis. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Heather Ash. So in like three minutes I came in and Heather's like, okay, we're styling you. <laughs> joy to be back here. I went to undergraduate here in 1984. I first moved to Davis, and so cycle. <laughs> really, really fun. So I'd like to start with just a little grounding. So if you would close your eyes and settle in, get comfortable. And taking a breath into your belly. Feeling into something that you're grateful for tonight. Anything in your life. And then take that from a thought and let go of what stimulated that sense of gratitude and really bring the feeling into your heart. And just experience. I'd like you to also thank yourself for coming out tonight, whatever it was that brought you here. Just thank yourself for your willingness to step towards whatever the heck warrior God is doing for you. And when you're ready, you can just go ahead and open your eyes and be present. So, I'll just start with this quick preface around myself and the book. And as Adam said that um, we both went to undergrad here and we met as journalists at UC. I oh, know we worked, yes, journalists at California. I mean. <laughs> so I grew up in Southeast Asia, moved all over the place when I was a kid. And when I first came to Davis, I was like, what is wrong? Not <laughs> and I couldn't name it though, I just knew that I felt disconnected and I feel like felt like people around me were disconnected. And I was raised in countries that were deeply connected to spirit and to family and to each other. And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. So for two years I was political around anything you could be political around. And two years in I went, okay, wait a minute, I'm pissed off. All my friends are super angry and nothing's changed. And so I was like, this is important. So that's when I, when I started studying different spiritual traditions. And literally, Adam and I went to the library one day, one summer, I told her over this moment, checked out every book we could on earth spirituality and goddess spiritual reading. And we were like, what is this stuff? We don't know. And then carried the books back and spent the summer reading. And going, oh my god, listen to this! <laughs> so, and that just opened everything. So where I started was around European shamanism. Because I felt, I'm of European descent, I'm curious, what did my ancestors, ancestors, ancestors believe? And what I learned was the importance of us to come back into the cycles, especially as women. We're in a very linear thought society, that you do this, you do this, you do this, and then you're supposed to get someplace, which isn't the way life works, that you may have noticed. 
that there's these cycles that we're in. So that was a big piece of that tradition. And then there was a point where I realized, again, something's missing. I couldn't name what it was. And about that time, I had a dream. And in the dream, this man showed up. And I knew in my mind, like, I'm going to study with this man. And this, my life is about to completely change. And then we're waking up thinking, right, where am I going to meet this powerful person in Davis, California? And literally a week later, someone came to my office and said, oh my god, you have to meet this man. And I went, I'm not ready. Oh no. And made a whole lot, no. And it took me a year. And that man was Don Miguel Ruiz, who's the author of The Four Agreements. And when I got myself ready to drag all of my class with me one day to go meet him, and walked into the room and just fell in love. I was like, these are my people. And then I met Miguel. And I was really blessed. The next month, he took on and I just jumped in full feet. And so my work now is about blending these different traditions that I've been blessed to be part of and really to bring, synthesize down what's the most practical way that we as modern Western women can use these ancient traditions to help ourselves to transform, to help ourselves come back into a life. Because here's the thing, a hundred years ago, just a hundred years ago, a little bit over, women didn't have the right to vote. And we're about to possibly vote for our first female president. hundred years, that's not very much time. And as women, a hundred years ago, we had very few rights, we had very few possibilities. We have pretty much had one choice, which was getting married, having kids, and taking care of the family. There were, of course, some women that were outside of that, but more, most, mostly that was what the path was. So while as women in the West, this isn't true around the world, unfortunately, but at, at least in the West, we have an incredible amount of external freedom. We can vote, we can choose who we want to partner with, we can really work with the job that we want to work So our external freedoms are incredible. And we have a lot of women and men behind us to, to, to thank for that, that struggled and fought and created the pathways to open. But what I've noticed is this, is that while we have all these external freedoms, we don't have as many internal freedoms. We're still chained to old ways of thinking about ourselves and each other. So as women, we've often been incredibly domesticated to take care of everybody else, to not think about ourselves to put ourselves down, to compare ourselves and to compete with other women, to, to not really feel like we can bring our full light out. There's this sense of like, is it okay? Is it really okay for me to shine? So what Warrior God, the Warrior Goddess work is about, it's about us as women saying, yes, I can be authentically 100% myself and getting free on the inside. How do we get free on the inside? That's what my passion is about. And what we're chained to is, as I see it, we each have, see if you agree with me, this, what I call the image of perfection. So this image of who we're supposed to be in the world. And what we often do is spend our time comparing ourselves to who we're supposed to be or who we were, instead of living here. So our whole focus is on comparing ourselves to this and then comparing ourselves out here. And that causes us incredible suffering. And we're not with ourselves. We've disconnected. And so, really, the warrior goddess work is about coming back home to ourselves fully, 100%. So we're, we let this go. We realize, this you're never going to do this. And that's OK. You know, I took a, I about a year, when, some time, in the past, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do everything that voice of perfection tells me to. Like, I'm gonna nail this. And I did. There was like a three second video where I listened and I did everything it told me to do, basically. Now, do you suppose that when I hit that mark, it went, that voice went, awesome, Heather Ash, you rock, high five, I'm retiring. <laughs> what did it say? Yes, but. That was good enough, yeah, and but, right? You cannot win, and we think we can. You can't win against that. It's a losing proposition.
because that voice is not talking to you for, about your best interest. It's trying to keep you safe. And safety and freedom don't go together. You can be safe, but there's a huge consequence. And we don't need more safe people. We actually need more women that are wild and free and are finding their voice and their power and bringing it into the world. <laughs> So when Warrior Goddess Training first came out, the first really beautiful book that Heather showed, there's a really fun thing that you can do as an author, which you can call all your friends and say, hey, I just wrote a book, go on Amazon and buy it on this day. And all your friends go to Amazon and buy it on a day and become a bestseller for a day. And it's like super like, oh, I was a bestseller on Amazon for one day. And then it plummets back to like number 11 million, 453. <laughs> <laughs> So what was different about Warrior Goddess training is I did the whole party and yay and all my friends bought the book thank you all. And the book shot up to number one in two categories, shamanism and goddess books. And it never came down again. So over two years later it continues to be number one in those two categories. And it's because <laughs> it's because of one thing. We as women are ready to do something different. And there's something I've had, so many women are like, the cover, the word, like, warrior goddess, what is that? What it is, is it's an energy that's deeply needed right now, I believe for all of us, not just women. And yay for my dear, dear friend Craig for being here. Always let the men come up. Yes! I've read all my books and listened to five more podcasts of mine than anybody on the planet. <laughs> so, Warrior energy. Warrior energy is about our clarity, our focus, our presence. It's about 100% yes, I'm in. We'll talk more about yes, too. So I'd love you to do something with me. Everyone stand up for a moment. <coughs> so warrior energy, I'd like you to feel this in your body. Yeah, it is sound too. Hundred percent. So bring yourself a hundred percent here. Go. Awesome. How's it feel? Power. Focus. Yeah, got more. Good. What else? What do you notice? Strength. Energy. Yeah. Great. Good. And then goddess energy. Hello. Is this? One more time. How does that feel? Soft, 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 open, receiving fluid, relax. Great. Good. Go ahead and come see Thank you. So that goddess energy is our creativity. It's our openness. It's the yes as well. And the, the beauty of these two things is it's not that we're here like, okay, I'm going to be 50% warrior and 50% goddess and I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> it's not about that. And people also come to me and they're like, oh, I get it, you're balancing the masculine and feminine. No, I'm not. <laughs> we're taking two qualities and finding what's our expression of those qualities. What's our expression? And some of us are very warrior-oriented. That's our essence. That's our nature. And some of us are more goddess-oriented. That's our nature. So what we want to do is come to find what's my essence, and also be able to use both of these qualities skillfully. So even if you are super goddess, you want to be able to pull that warrior up whenever it's needed. Right? Even if you're super warrior, you want to be able to call up that goddess energy when it's needed. Because there's different situations where that's what's called for. And some of us are more 50-50 warrior goddess. But you're going for what's your expression. And recognizing, too, as women, that we often create shells. So we create these layers of, I'm supposed to be more warrior, or I'm supposed to be more goddess. And so we want to, so much of this is around unlearning to come back to our office. So once we got this training came out, I started getting letters from women all around the world, asking questions, sharing incredible stories of places that they were struggling, asking for advice. 
And as I was answering these women and, and women and feeling into what the questions were, what I started doing is gathering what were the biggest pain points that we as women are experiencing in our lives right now. And that was the foundation of Warrior Man's Way. So I took all of that information and ate it and digested it, <laughs> basically, and sat with it and then brought out the Warrior God's Way. And so Warrior God's Way is a deepening into how do we take these tools and use them to transform different areas of our life that we're stuck. So there's three main pillars with Warrior God's Way, and there's a secret. It's kind of an obvious secret. Way. So the three pillars, wisdom, <laughs> second pillar, authenticity, hey. third pillar, yes. yes. <laughs> so that's the way. The way is how do we begin to walk holding our wisdom, our authenticity, and our yes. And that's what we'll be exploring today. Those three pillars and how do we bring them into our lives. So wisdom, we each have deep wisdom in ourselves, in our bones. When we come out of our little mind <coughs> and come into our bodies, everything starts to shift. So that's why I'm so passionate, like, we need to stop comparing ourselves to who we think we're supposed to be and really come here, because here's where our wisdom is, in the body, in this present moment. Not, ooh, when I was 20, I could do that, I can't do it now. Or, if I haven't hit this mark, I'm just going to judge myself because I should be a here. Not helping us get to our wisdom. And those are habits that we want to start to, to clear. So as we come back to ourselves, what we're starting to do is to learn to listen to what's true for me. What's true for me. And some of the things that we journey through towards our wisdom is to really learn to start forgiving ourselves and to start forgiving others. Why? And there's a whole section in Warrior Goddess Way of here are things around why people think we shouldn't forgive. And there's a long list of why people think we shouldn't forgive that are really good reasons. <laughs> but I go through each one and like, and here's why he's so hard. Here's another one. Why? Why? Because you don't want to carry that weight. It's about ourselves. Uh, I take groups to Peru, and there was one journey that I was in Peru, and one of the shamans, we were, he was doing healings, and he kept muttering in Spanish as people would come up to do the healing, take your backpack off, take your backpack off. I'm like, and I find like, the third person, I'm like, got it. Because what he was seeing is all of this huge weight that everybody was carrying. And that's what happens when we don't forgive, when we hold on to it, especially not forgiving ourselves. Because my guess is you probably made one or two mistakes in your life. Just guess. <laughs> and how many of us haven't forgive, forgiven ourselves for things that we've done? And we're still carrying it. And anytime we don't forgive somebody else, we're carrying them as well. We're carrying whatever the event is, and we're carrying their energy as well. And so really, part of coming back to our wisdom is learning how to forgive. Okay? We'll talk more about this, about the rightness of forgiving. Because I am definitely not a, you must forgive, and then you'll get to your wisdom at all. There's, there's a process. We'll talk about that in yes as well. The other thing to help us get back to our wisdom is the other thing I notice as women is we have a tendency, not all of us, but many women have a tendency to apologize constantly. Anybody fall anybody fall this category? Is it just me? So if somebody can step on my toe and I'll say, oh I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not that now, but I used to be like, oh. And as I started tracking that in myself, I realized I just apologize for everything. Like there's a way I'm apologized for just for existing. And I really believe that's a cultural thing that's gotten passed down or ancestral thing that's gotten passed down. So as women to come back into our wisdom, we need to start looking at where am I apologizing unconsciously and start to shift that pattern. And then also looking at where am I not willing to apologize? Where do I go into defense rather than just saying, I'm sorry? 
So learning what apology really is, the deepness of connecting to someone from your heart and saying, I'm sorry. And facing that rather than running from it. And also letting go of that just unconscious, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. I'm sorry for existing. You get to take up space. You get to take up space. Oh, it. And as we do that, we start again dropping into our wisdom. There's another piece around wisdom, and this is one of my favorite parts of the book, which is around our story. So each of us are storytellers. That's what we do as humans. Our brain makes some stories, and we're really good at it. And you can make up a story that frees you, and you can make up a story that chains you. We have stories from our past that bring us more energy, or stories from our past that drain our energy. So when we recognize that we are responsible for our stories, how we tell ourselves our story, we take our power back. We'll explore more about this, but one of the things I've noticed about stories is that there's what I call ripe stories and unripe stories. And this is a big piece, because I've seen a lot of us create a tremendous amount of suffering around our unripe stories, and also hang out with our ripe stories and ignore them until they start kind of rotting. So, what is ripe and unripe? I had a story when I was living in Davis, and people would say, where'd, where'd you grow up? And my story was this. I grew up in Southeast Asia, and we moved every two years, which meant that we moved someplace, I would be the off, awkward, gawky kid, I wouldn't know anybody, I'd be super shy. And then about a year in, I'd start settling in, I'd make friends, I'd start opening up, I'd get excited about where we were living, and then we'd move. And so the cycle would start over again. So by the time I came to college, I was felt really disconnected. I was scared to make friends because they were leaving or I was leaving. And I had just a wee bit of issues with it. So how does that story feel? Sad. Sad, yeah, I broke down, yeah. And that's what I realized one day. I'm telling my story, and I'm like, I am so bored of this story. <laughs> Every time I tell it, it doesn't feel good anymore. It doesn't feel good in my body. It doesn't resonate with me. And so I thought, okay, I've been studying with Miguel for a couple of years, so like, let's just change it and see what happens. So the next time somebody else asked me, so I said I was raised in Southeast Asia, we moved every two years, so by the time I was 15 I'd been to Egypt and Austria and Germany and India and to the States all over the place. I had been to so many different cultures. So by the time that I moved to the United States, I was incredibly open-minded, very, very compassionate, and had a deep passion for intimacy, and knew how to connect with different people. How's that one feel? Okay, okay, which one's true? Both and neither. It's a story. So when we get that, that's huge. When we get they're not true because they're not happening now, it's fluid. You get to be the storyteller and choose how you want to tell your story. What will serve you the best? Now, this is not about going, I hate that story, I don't like it, I'm going to just put a better story on top of it. That doesn't work. Because what that's like is taking a beach ball and pushing it under the water, which takes a tremendous amount of energy, and then trying to put something else here while you're bouncing, you can put a beach ball under the water. What's going to happen? It's going to pop up. Because you haven't really rewritten the story, you've just tried to bury it. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to bring the story up. And when it's right, and how do you know it's right? Because you're kind of bored of it. Or you're just like, this is just ready. You just feel it in your body. I think I can shift my perspective a little bit. It can be just a tiny shift, and it'll shift everything. It'll shift how you feel about yourself, how you see the story. So that's a right story. But then there are unright stories. And an unright story is a story that has a lot of energy in it. Still, that you're attached to. It's one you're not ready to connect with. And those are the ones usually we're like, I'm done with that story, I just want it to go away. But if you really feel into it, it's not right yet. So we want to be really gentle with ourselves around this idea of is it right or is it unright? And to love them equally. 
Because the truth is, some of us, I think most of us, are going to go through our life with a lot of unright story. And can we love ourselves through the places we're not right? Is that okay? The answer is yes, we can. And if you love those unright stories, it's all good. It's all good. I am probably going to go to my deathbed hoping that everyone on the planet loves me. I'm a Libra. <laughs> no, but that's one of my core, my like core things. Have I done a ton of work on it? Yes. Am I much better? Yes. That's part of the default. Okay. So maybe you'll write them one day. But I've just learned to just go, oh, sweetie, there's that unwrapped story. You're OK. You're safe. Instead of, I'm a warrior goddess. I shouldn't have that story. Okay. Which is so not loving to ourselves. Okay. So with fruit, now we're going to talk about fruit for a minute. Are you ready? <laughs> How do you write them fruit? Put it in a brown paper bag. So one way is you take the fruit, you stick it in a brown paper bag. What's happening when you put it in the brown paper bag? It's so cool. What happens is it's in its own little environment, and so it's off-gassing. And the, the, what its own off-gasses then help it to ripen faster. Okay? So sometimes in order to ripen the story, you need to go away. <laughs> you need to isolate yourself. You need to sit with your own story. You need to be with the discomfort. You need to go to a brown paper bag and close it and be with the story. And you'll find your way through to write it. Another way to write them through. Put it next to another fruit. Exactly, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> find people that are ripe in the area you want to write in. Okay? So it doesn't mean that person has to be perfect in all angles and so you can stand next to them. It means if you are dealing with relationship and you're trying to ripen something around relationship, you find people that are like rocking on their relationships and you go stand next to them. You don't even have to talk to them necessarily. <laughs> Take in some of their body odor. Because <laughs> they've got it. Okay? They work that piece. We can really help each other in this way. And so, so what if their finances are a mess? You're not worried about that, right? So you don't have to like, I'm not standing next to them because they haven't dealt with everything. If they're ripe in that area that you want to write, ripen. So reading books, so physically being around people. When I figured this out, I was like, oh, no wonder I spent years like follow, literally following Miguel around. Like I was always right close to him. And I was like, right, I was ripening. I was just hanging out in his energy field. And there's something really powerful with that. So the books you read, the people that you hang out with, again, doesn't mean, please don't get this thing like, I must only hang out with right people. <laughs> it's not going to serve you either. You actually want people that are going to also push your buttons in a good way. I'll diverge for a second and then come back. That There was this um, amazing experience called the Bio this Biosphere experience that they did in Arizona many years ago, where they created a totally enclosed environment, and they put people into it, I think, for three years. And what happened in that environment is they planted a bunch of trees. There were a farm, and there's everything. But they had a bunch of trees, and for the first two years, the trees grew really fast. And they were like, rock on, look how cool this experiment is. And then the third year, all the trees fell over. <laughs> all the trees fell over. And when they opened up the environment and they figured out what happened, what they recognized is trees need wind to get their center. They have to have wind to get solid. So really, the more what we in the Toltec world call petty tyrants that you have in your life that make your life miserable, <laughs> Why? Because you are going to get so strong, you're going to find your center. Okay, yeah. Some of us are super strong, right? <laughs> so you don't want to avoid. We don't want to live our lives going, I'm going to avoid all the uncomfortable things in my life. Because you're not going to get that strength. This is where the warrior comes in. So, another way to ripen is to put it in the sun. Take fruit and put it in the sun. And what that does is it 
I see is that we take our stories and we bring them out, we share them with other people that can just sit and go, yeah, that's, yeah, that's your story, I'm here, I'm listening. So there's a way that when, when we as women open up and share our stories, we feel seen, we feel heard, we realize it's not just our story. I've been listening to and uh, uh, reading about women that were part of the first wave, or second, whatever you want to call it, of feminism in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And what they talked about was so, like, oh, is that they never talked to each other. And then they started sitting down and talking and realizing they all had the same issues. And how radical that was. That women had no, were not talking to each other at all. And so we need to keep doing the same thing of sharing our, bringing it into the light, bring it into the light, bring it into the light, so that it can get unraveled. And here's the thing I've seen. You know, or I know, I'll say this about myself. I know when I'm ready to heal the story, when it's starting to ripen, by who I call. I have friends that I can call and tell a story, and they'll be like, oh my god, I can't believe the bastard. <laughs> you should definitely be really pissed. I'll be like, I know, can you believe it? <laughs> and then I have other friends that I can call who are in this room, that I'll be like, and they'll be like, mm -hmm. how's it feel? <laughs> how's that working? Right? I, and I call those people when I'm actually ready, I'm, I'm ripe enough that I'm ready to unpack it. So just notice that, don't judge yourself for it, because I still call some of my friends and be like, can you believe this happened? They'll be like, I can't believe it! And it feels so good. But I know at some point I'm going to have to unwrap it, because it feels good in the short run, it doesn't feel good in the long run, right? Yeah. So that's, that's that exploration around Stories. Unripe, right. Love them both. Love them both. As we connect, as we unravel the old stories, create more space, because that's what it does. It creates more space inside of us. What happens naturally is we start stepping towards our authenticity. And authenticity is not something that we're, we have to find. It's something that we're unlayering. Because we're authentic. It's there. We just tend to put roles, ideas of who we're supposed to be on top of it. So coming back into our authenticity, for me, one of the best ways to reconnect with our authenticity is to get quiet, to sit, to go into stillness, to have some sort of a meditation or a sitting practice where we're reconnecting to our stillness over and over again. Because it's from our stillness that our authenticity arises naturally. I've seen people that I know, this is so fun. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that it starts to arise naturally from the stillness. Our stories, the old ways that we've thought of who we're supposed to be, do not lead to authenticity. They lead to more thought. But when we start to witness, and this is a key part of the Goddess, when we start to step back, and open and witness, what's my mind up to? What's happening in my emotional body? What's happening in my physical body? Then we start to learn to be more skillful around not just running down that path. Oh, it must be true. We recognize our mind says so much stuff that's not true. It's crazy. I read a statistic that every day you have about 65,000 thoughts. And that of those thoughts, 85% Plus, with the same thoughts you have before. And we're thinking them to ourselves. Who's listening and who's talking? Why do we have to keep repeating that? And part of this is just the habit. We just get into this habit. So we're training ourselves to go towards the stillness rather than towards the noise. And hold, I like to think about it, is that I'm holding whatever's happening from a place of connection to stillness. And what arises and naturally is our authenticity, is our unique expression. One of the things that I love about the Toltec work, and the, the Toltecs were a group of people that came together in South and Central Mexico to study perception. They're really curious about how do we create our reality. And the word Toltec means artist of the spirit. And then what our art is, is our life. That's our art. <coughs> And that for each of us, we are each a unique ray of light. And I love that metaphor. 
that we're each a unique ray of light. We're here to shine our light. Our, the world needs our particular light. When we're busy comparing ourselves, we're thinking, I don't like my life. We keep, we're not giving our gifts. But when we really connect into our authenticity and surrender up who we think we're supposed to be to land and who this being is now and get curious, who is this being? There's so many women that I've talked to are like, I have no idea who I am. No idea who I am. I've spent my life raising my kids or in my job or and now I don't know. And I'm like, great, what an awesome place to start from. Okay. What do you what do you love? What lights you up even a tiny bit? Go towards that. Go towards that. And see. Be curious. So for all of us to let go of who we've been or who we're supposed to be, to find out who is this be? What do, what do I love? And to start naming things that light you up and doing more of them. I always think about it that this work is one, do more things you love. What a terrible task. <laughs> Name, do more of the things you love. And the second one, clean up. Clean up the old beliefs and the grievance that arise. That's what leads us back into our authenticity, is, is the letting go of what's not us. And the reclaiming of, ooh, I love that. Okay. And love your quirks, love your flaws. One of my favorite stories is I had a, a roommate who had just fallen in love and had a new lover. And she told me this great story that one night she was confessing to her love. She's like, I have so many flaws. How can you love me? And her lover's like, sweetie, those aren't flaws. They're features. <laughs> <laughs> so, Love your features. <laughs> we all have features. It's great. And whatever it is that lights you up, do more of it. I'm not repeating myself. So that it goes into your being. Because we, we, we forget, right? We, like, I'm serious. I'm figuring this out. Don't have fun. One of my favorite things to do, one of my weird quirks, is I love running down hallways. So I literally, I get a hallway going. <laughs> I think it's from living in a hotel in Bangkok for six months with my sister. I terrorized the hotel. <laughs> but it lights me up. Why not? Makes some jars to light me up. I have a couple. I think I counted once I organized it. I'm like, I need that with you five <laughs> So whatever it is, no matter how quirky, celebrate it. Celebrate it. That's part of your authenticity. That's part of your sweetness. So our third pillar in the Warrior Goddess Way is this word, yes. And I had debates of like, should the word be yay? Because if you know me, you know that I say yay constantly, pretty much. So we decided to go for yes, but you all know that it is also yay. You are welcome to use yay as often as possible. And yay will happen when like my tire will be flat. I'll be like, yes, I have a flat tire. Yay! <laughs> Because I retrained myself to celebrate everything. <laughs> Seriously. Celebrate everything. Here's what happens. Most of us, something unpleasant arises, and what do we do? Yeah, resist, our energy goes away, we judge it, we judge ourselves, we close. And anytime you close, what you're doing is closing to yourself. Closing to your creativity, closing to your love, closing to your own presence. So yes is about reclaiming ourselves so that something different arises and we just go, I'm here. Because what's going to happen is your creativity is going to stay intact. You're going to show up and be able to go like, what is this? How do I work with this? And you'll stay connected to your wisdom and your authenticity in that moment. Now, this is super not easy. This is like serious warrior god of shit, right? Because to, to be able to retrain yourself that something difficult happens and you open instead of closing, whoa. How do we do that? We do that by opening to our closures. That's where it starts. So again, witness. You notice yourself closing to something. You go, oh, look how well I'm resisting. You notice yourself judging. Wow, my judge is like And you open to the judgment. 
what we usually do is like, I'm judging myself because I'm judging, because I shouldn't be judging. So if I'm spiritual, I wouldn't be judging. <laughs> so practice opening to the closure. There's a funny part in the book where I talk about stepping in dog do one morning. In my new clean shoes. And tracking it across the floor. And being like, Yay! I get to wear a new pair of shoes. <laughs> that anything that you, any little thing you can begin to practice on. So when you practice on the little things, what happens when the big things arise is you, it becomes more natural to rather than close. But it's a, a deep practice. Now, <clears throat> we just had this discussion today. I'm in the middle of this really beautiful 21 day giveaway right now online, and I'll. Oh, Anybody? Okay, check this out. Um, so if anybody wants to be on my mailing list and be, jump into the Warrior Guys 21 Day Giveaway, we're, we're two weeks in, we have a week to go, but it's really beautiful because I'm doing a little audio every day, five, six minute audio and the teaching and a piece of art from the community that's Gorgeous, and all the information's there, so you'll have access to all the stuff from the past as well. So if you want to play, I always forget to do this later, so I'm just going to pass it around. So if you're not on my list, you'd like to be, you know what I'm up to. <coughs> so I just lost my train of thought. Yay, dog! Yay! Yay, 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 Yay. Yay. <laughs> Starting with the little things. <laughs> Start with the small things. Smells. I have a smell. Don't like the smell. Closing to it. I'm turning towards the smell in a moment. <laughs> Seriously. Because it will retrain you. So when the big thing arises, you're like, I'm here. I'm present. I'm ready. So practice in little ways. And this is true of everything. You know, people will say to me, well, how do, well, how do I deal with it when I go home and my family's judging me and they're telling me that I'm doing my life wrong. How do I open then? And I'm like, too late. You need to be practicing opening in like a million different places in your life. You're going to have any hope of opening in this big situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. When my dad was had leukemia, my dad is a Buddhist, and when he got leukemia, I remember just feeling so heartbroken for him because he hadn't practiced. And when he needed the most, he couldn't meditate. It was in way too much pain. And he didn't have practice in his bed. It was rough. And he, he, got to, he got to work it, for sure. But I, at that moment, I was like, right, you can't wait till the emergency happens to expect yourself to then drop into the stillness or your authenticity or your yes or your wisdom, right? It's, it's too hard. But if you practice in all the little ways, you'll be able to. There's just a tiny bit. So in the grocery store, this happened yesterday. I'm on the train on the way up here, and there were some really loud people talking really loud about oh politics, <laughs> and like joking with each other, and they've been drinking obviously. And I think I thought I should just move. Like I'm in my sun zone. I'm working on my book. People are bothering me, <coughs> and I felt into it. I'm like, no, practice opening, sweetie. So I just opened. My field. So instead of like, I don't like them, what are they doing? They're driving me crazy. Can't they running over here? I'm in my zone. Hello. <laughs> I just hope that like, they have as much right to do exactly what they're doing as I do. And I can move, but let me practice. And it was great. The moment I opened, it stopped fucking. It was fine. So that's the skill that, and grocery stores are your best place to practice. <laughs> So you you notice something like there's somebody fighting in the next aisle over. I used to do this in grocery stores all like Davis and Nicola. Mm -hmm. I'd be like anger happening. I don't love anger. So I didn't. Now I'm great with it. But mm -hmm. move towards like and sometimes I would just move my car and just be like, hmm. okay, we're good, we're safe. It's okay. So you practice moving towards the discomfort. I'd say one of the hallmarks of Warrior Goddess is that we're learning to move towards discomfort rather than away from it. And it's not because we're sadistic. 
It's because we want to be free. It's because we want to be free. And any place you're closing down is because there's an agreement happening. Imagine this. We should reflect this. So, if you were raised in a family that thought blue-haired children were growing up, they were geniuses, they were amazing, they were going to succeed in everything they did, and that in your family it was also believed that green-haired children, well, they just weren't that smart. They weren't, well, your sibling's really smart, but, well, you could get married, or you're, uh, you could do, like, do something. You can do this. Maybe, imagine now the whole society feels that. So, you're the blue-haired child, you've just gotten accepted to UC Davis, it's your first job day on campus, you're walking across campus and you're like, And someone comes up to you and says, what are you doing on campus? You don't belong here. Get off campus. What would your reaction be? Your whole life you've been told, you're going to succeed. You've got this. You're the blue haired child. What would your reaction be? Whatever. You'd be like, they're having a weird day. Well, nothing to do with me. Right? And then you'd go on with your day. It wouldn't create a blip. Because there's no resonance in your body that that is true. Now. See where we're going? Green haired child. Green haired child somehow got into UC Davis, not sure how. Oh, <laughs> your parents came, saw uh, somebody <laughs> walking through campus the first day. Someone comes up and says, What are you doing here? You don't belong. What's their reaction? You're right. So here's what we do. We do we go one of two paths when that happens. I'm sure there's more, but this is the two that I see. One path is contraction. They're right. Oh my god, they saw me. I'm never going to be able to succeed. And either they're going to drop out immediately, or that is going to go in and is going to dismantle, it's going to infect, because the infection's already there. right? It's going to keep dismantling their confidence until they drop out at some point. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So that's one thing. Or we do this. I'm going to succeed. What are you talking about? I'm fine. I'm going to make it happen. We go into rebellion. We push. We fight. The great thing about, about rebellion is that when we go into rebellion, we will push through our own fears and our own barriers to get things done. But there's a downside to rebellion. Anger. Yeah. Yeah. And disconnect. We're not in our authenticity. We're in fight mode all the time. So at some point, the rebellion has to be unwoven as well. Because what it is, did it change the primary belief? So what you have is you have rebellion and, and yeah, green hair beliefs, right? Okay. So that needs to get on board so this can get here. So there's nothing outside of us. Everything's reflecting back beliefs that we have. Anytime you get triggered, you can go, it's them, they're doing it. But the truth is, it's something inside of you is resonating. It might not be exactly the same thing. But there's some old belief that's getting that has gotten lit up. The good thing is this. Anytime we go into discomfort, what's connected to it is an old belief or an agreement. Every belief and agreement we've ever made in our life takes energy. I'm going to repeat that again because this is okay. Every agreement you've ever made in your life takes energy. What that means, if there's an obstacle in your life that has this much energy, and you have this much energy, who wins? What happens? The obstacle, right? But if the obstacle has this much energy, and you have this much energy, what happens? You don't even notice it's an obstacle, right? Or you're just like, ah, oh, I can step over that. That's easy. Pop quiz. Who put the energy in the obstacle? Even. The good news is, when you, the moment you recognize that, without judgment, without blame, and yes, did you inherit obstacles from your family, great, great, great grandmother, from your culture? Yes. But the moment you take it on, it's yours. We take responsibility for that, we can do something. If we don't take responsibility for it, we're helpless. We can't do anything. And as much as I would like to be able to control everyone on the planet to do what I want them to do, because I'm right, obviously. 
You ever notice this? People just don't behave. <laughs> and all that energy we, we spend on making other people behave, stop it. There's only one person you can change. True. One person. <coughs> commit to that person. You. And commit to begin to pull the energy out. Of the, an obstacle arises, yay! Because what you're seeing, the moment an obstacle arises, is your energy. It's where your energy is locked. Here's another way to, to see it. How long do you have time? It's about 8 10. Okay, thank you. Awesome. That's a good thing. Awesome. So, anytime you set an intent, you get clear, I want a new job, I want to love more, whatever the intent is, whether it's really tangible or very broad, what you're doing, I believe, is planting a seed into the universe and saying, hey, universe, I want more of this. And I feel the universe goes, awesome, that's cool. And then, something happens. And the something is synchronicities, allies start showing up, you get all the support that starts to show up. And, or, the obstacles start to show up. So everything between you and where you want to go starts to show up, all the obstacles. And what we've often been trained to do is an obstacle arises and we go, oh, well, I, I didn't want to go there anyway. Or, oh, see, I, I, I don't deserve it. Or, it's not fair, it's my mother! <laughs> she impressed on me longer, I wouldn't have this obstacle! <laughs> Whatever we do with it, to blame or judge, to feel victimized by it or to blame. <laughs> that we could use to unmantle the belief that's causing the obstacle to present in its way. And there's going to be obstacles. And it's not saying, if you do this right, there'll be no obstacles in your life. No. You might notice you're in a body. You might notice your body's aging. You might notice people die, people abandon, people change. Just because you show up present doesn't mean that all everything's going to go away and your life's going to be right, going to be perfect. And that means you're doing it perfectly. That is spiritual nonsense. We are going to be broken open over and over again. Our hearts are going to get broken, I believe. And that's a good thing. Because every time we really feel into that tenderness of being human and let ourselves feel our grief and feel our life, we open in a beautiful way. There's so much power in going towards the discomfort and opening to it. And listening to what's the obstacle here. And it's always going to be our perception. Because life's just doing life. And I love, there's a, one of my favorite quotes by Byron Katie is, you can fight against reality, but reality is going to win. Only 100% of the time. <laughs> so an obstacle arises, what I pray for all of us is you go, you are a worthy obstacle. And you go, wind. Okay, here's the wind. Awesome. This is going to make me more resilient, stronger, more present, more compassionate. You can use everything in your life to benefit you. You can also use everything in your life against you. And most of us have learned to use everything against ourselves. We read a spiritual book, and then three days later, we're judging ourselves because we're not doing what it said. Right? We're inspired by someone, and then we're like, yeah, but I'll never be like that. But you can use everything you like to serve you, no matter what it is. Now, I had a moment when where does no, when my first book, sorry, Twelfth Night Path, came out. Um, had a big, big break in my life, so, so it's it's funny now. My dear friends that are here know it was not funny. Um, there were many late night calls. So this book comes out. The book's about change. That week, my business partner, my beloved, my husband, you know, father of the community that we had created, moved out of the house. And so I'm like, I just gave up to a birth, and I just like lost my beloved in one week. 
I remember picking up the book and opening to the first page, and the, the first paragraph says, have you ever had your life turn upside down in a moment? And I slammed and was like, you have Great, I wrote a book for myself. <laughs> Now I have to figure out how to live this. It was a really, really hard time. But there was a moment in that when, as I was going through it, it took, it took a long time. It wasn't right for many, many years. I'll just say that. It took me two or three years for it to get right all the way. That when there was a moment I realized, wow, I feel so broken right now and so terrified around love that I could close and armor my heart and never love again. That that would be the easy path. And I just was like, and I don't want to do that. I want to use this, the most difficult thing that's ever happened to me to date, to open me more. And that was just my command. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But I just set that intent and that commitment. I want to use this to open me. And it, it did. I'm so grateful now. Because I was willing look at what do I actually want here? How do I use this for me rather than against me? And believe me, there's there a lot of using it against me. But that's what friends are for. Mm -hmm. right? So, wisdom, authenticity, yes. The wisdom is that as we have experiences, we deepen. We learn. We grow. And wisdom isn't about being Wisdom is actually about embracing all that life is, all the parts of us. And that all the, all the different parts of us also contain wisdom. And I like to think about it as that we each have a wise child self, this innocent, like, clay, wise child. And we all have a very wise elder self as well. And we need both of them. We need that crazy, clay, fun energy, innocent. And we also need that wise, I've been through it all, we're all going to survive. Energy as well. Authenticity, that it's not something we strive to find, it's something that we become by unlayering, by looking at what is and what does not feel like it's me. Let that go. And that there's ways, one of my favorite ways to work with that is stillness practices and also using our senses. Going back into our senses, what am I smelling here? What if, what am I tasting? The moment we come back into our senses, we come, we're more authentic. Because we're actually here, in the present moment. You know, if you really want to have a scary experience, <coughs> I invite you to sit still for 10 minutes with a piece of paper with the word past, present, and future written on it. And every time you have a thought about the past, put a little check, a little mark. Any time you have a thought about future, put a little mark. Anytime you ever thought about the present, what would you thought if I thought the present would be like? <laughs> what you'll mostly find is, oh my god, did I turn the oven off? I don't know if I'm doing this right. Do you think I'm okay? Would other people meditate so much better. <laughs> Maybe if I keep meditating, I'll be, I mean, our mind You'll find that your mind is bouncing past. So using our senses helps us come back here. And then, yes, learning to open to everything. And opening to our closures, opening to our fears, opening to our judgments. There's beauty that happens when we start to open to everything and move towards the discomfort rather than moving away from it. And that brings us back into our wisdom. Yay! <laughs> So this place of celebrating is a radical act, I believe, especially in these times. And also the, the, the need for us to be real, to be vulnerable, to show up with each other is so important as well.